Manx Radio Podcasts, powered by Shaw. The Nation Station, Manx Radio. Hello and welcome to the latest look back at Talking Heads. A blanket ban on legal highs, loyalty to a bank, and attracting young people back to live in the Isle of Man were all up for discussion on the programme this week. Here's Stu Peters with more. Talking Heads, brought to you by Magic Carpets, with the only Dean design showroom on the island. What are your thoughts on the appointment of a commercial promoter for the TT? Should the finer details of the implications of the appointment have been sorted out before it was put forward for political approval? The amount of discussion behind the scenes before the appointment of Vision 9 was put forward for debate in Timwald has been questioned. Government has taken back control of the 2017 TT and Classic TT, and Vision 9 says it's yet to be provided with information on when a handover will take place. Last week it was claimed the implications for government departments of growing the event under a commercial promoter was put forward as one of the reasons for the delay. Backbench MHK Kate Beecroft, who opposed the motion in Timwald, has questioned that reason. Should all of the details have been worked out fully before the motion was taken to Timwald for approval? Or is it important that moves like this are given at least a political seal of approval before resources are actually used to work out the fine detail? We're talking about this Vision 9 debacle. Uh, everybody thought that Vision 9 were going to be taking over TT and the, uh, the Festival of Motorcycling next year. Not happening now because uh, the contract's not being signed because the there have been various issues have been uh, have been identified and as an outsider to this and i'm not taking a huge amount of interest in the story but as an outsider to this the bits that i've seen it makes me sort of think about this silo mentality that the chief minister has been talking about for for donkey's years actually that every department sits and does its own thing without much reference to the outside world and certainly to the rest of government and i wonder if that's what's happened here if the DED, in its uh, rush, you know, probably rightfully so, to get somebody that they think can uh, enhance the uh, amount of money that we make out of the TT, so they're in a rush to get these people signed up and, and ready to go. Uh, these people have said, right, this is what we need to do. Have various departments at that point, when they've been told what is it going to be expected of them, said, well, it's nothing to do with us. <laughs> this is your deal. We're not going to paint the white lines then when you want them doing, no, no. or whatever it might be. Do you think that that's what it is? Do you think it's silo mentality again? Or do you think it's, uh, it, it's more than that? If you've got a thought about this and uh, whether or not the politicians and everybody else have had plenty of time to look at this and work out if there are going to be any wrinkles uh, and whether or not people are just sort of uh, effectively treading water while this deal should have been done. Stu, the Manx government together with the ACU ran the TT very well. I can see why some politicians want to unload it as they, want, as they don't want to be blamed for the costs incurred. Leave it to the government to run it. Outsiders only want profit for a minister to say he would be responsible if there was an earth slip is ludicrous. Leave it to the departments who do it now. That from North Norman. Uh, Phil Gorn got involved, reason that nothing's happening. Look at Douglas Prom. <laughs> okay. Vision 9 have realised that they're out of the depth and sphere of knowledge. They really are looking for a way out. Now that's interesting because the impression I get is that it's the Isle of Man that's holding the job up rather than Vision 9. But uh, maybe there's something in that. I don't know. Vision 9 would need to have a contract with all stakeholders, not just the DED. There are far too many. I make it 12 to make it feasible. Well, no, the contract would be with the Isle of Man government. Sylvia called. The commercial promoter says it wants to expand things at Nobles Park. I wouldn't like to see that happen. OK. The Nation Station. Thanks, Radio. Do you welcome increased steps to clamp down on the so-called uh, legal high drugs? There's to be a blanket ban on the substances as Treasury makes a move to follow the UK's lead. A legal order has been made banning the import, export, production and possession with intent to supply of all psychoactive substances on the Isle of Man. The Psychoactive Substances Act 2016 Application Order 2016, to give it its full title, comes into effect on the 18th of August. What do you think about this? Is it a positive step? Is a blanket ban the answer when it comes to cutting the use of these legal highs? Or is this inevitable that ways will always be found to bypass the legislation? And just a thought, are there too many restrictions on recreational substances? John Moss just asked the question about booze, the fact that the government makes a lot of tax out of booze, and that's all right. 
And the answer was that, you know, people are uh, dying by using legal highs. Well, I suggest that far more people die drinking booze or after drinking booze than do by using legal highs. Um, maybe there are too many restrictions. I'm not advocating that people use drugs at all. But uh, it is a bit of a worry, this kind of thing. You know, there are more and more restrictions on what we choose to do with our, uh, our spare time. Stu, as a bit of a petrol head, how do I stand with nitrous oxide on the bike? Well, you don't stand, do you? Uh, Nos, yeah. Uh, yes, I guess a high when the button is pushed. Is that what they mean? Love the show. That's from Andy and Onken. Uh, no, uh, if you're getting a high when you push the button, then you've got the feed pipe going into your helmet instead of into the carburetor, I would have thought. Uh, nitrous oxide, is that the same as laughing gas? Because I seem to remember seeing one piece of paper this morning looking at the research that said that that isn't uh, allowed anymore. Um, if you're serious, Andy, you, you need to talk to your supplier and see what, what the legislation is going to mean to you. If, if you really do have a motorbike that runs on nitrous oxide, which is complete and utter madness, I have to say, uh, then uh, you need to check with your supplier of gas and, uh, and find out what it's going to mean. Um, it, it's not intended to do away with people that have got a valid use, so I'm sure that you can find some sort of an exemption. Rob called the designer packaging on some of these legal highs entices people. They're all in fancy packets. Well, that's marketing for you. But on a broader issue, there are lots of counterfeit goods imported from China, and that's harming people in the Western world. Something should be done to cut down on that. What we're talking about in terms of counterfeit goods, you know, Rolex, fake Rolexes aren't going to do anybody any harm, are they? Apart from the fact that they're going to get ripped off usually. Uh, are you talking about drugs and things like that, Rob? Not sure. Uh, Dave says, you need to wake up, Stu. <laughs> need to go to sleep how many people do you know who've died from one drink uh, well th not from one drink maybe there, there will be some uh, around the world um, but uh, not one drink but the first session uh, I would think that quite a few young people have died from uh, their first real session in a boozer somewhere um, got absolutely legless and fallen under a bus or whatever on the way home. Uh, many youngsters have died from taking their first high from the rubbish that's being peddled. I used the word rubbish rather than the word that you chose, Dave. Um, OK, I, I just think that, I don't know, there's just something that, that jars with me about the fact that booze is all right, but anything else isn't. Who's to say that that's valid? Um, and I'm not a, a, a drug user. Uh, it's ages and ages. I think I was in Amsterdam the last time that I, I smoked marijuana. Um, and I don't have a problem with it, you know. And a lot of people who do use marijuana say that it's actually a lot more socially acceptable uh, than people who get falling over argumentative, violent drunk. The worst thing that happens if you uh, smoke marijuana is that you get hungry <laughs> and cuddly and funny, usually. Uh, governments want to ban all substances that may be harmful to us so that they can keep us healthier, working longer and paying taxes for longer. Retirement age will be up to 80 soon, says Josh. I don't think it's that. I just think it's people who want to have control over us. Um, and it does worry me. And like I say, I'm not advocating the use of drugs for anybody. But it does worry me that, you know, it's a bit like Animal Farm. Booze good for some vague reason, you know, that it's been around forever. So And they've got the system well sorted out for taxing the use of booze. Uh, anything else is bad. And I'm convinced it's down to tax and this, this thing about control uh, in that these uh, illegal drugs tend to come from disreputable uh, sources rather than from big multinational brands. I don't know what you think about it, so do give me a call on 661368. That's what Andrew's done. Let's have a word with him about it. Hello, Andrew. Mankind has been taking, has been wanting to uh, change his thinking by way of taking substances since the beginning, beginning of time, you yes. know. So, and, uh, but uh, it's just in human nature. It's even in the nature of cats, you know, with catnip. Yeah, sure. <laughs> And uh, I would suggest that our, it's, it's, it's all a bit hypocritical. I I'm, not, I'm not saying legal highs are, are good; they aren't. But they, and they do kill a few people, but they do not kill half. They do not. Kill, it's a fraction of the number of people that are killed by alcohol, which is one of the major killers in the world. It won't always feature on the death certificate, but it's there, and it's one of the absolute major killers and, and, and rampaging 
riot courses. Well, it, it ruins happens. other lives as well as the person who takes it, of course, alcohol, doesn't it? That's yes, the, absolutely. That's the it other effect. The whole family, yes, and yeah. friends, yes. Okay. So it's just as dangerous to, it's dangerous to the body, the kidneys, the liver, sure. the brain, of course. And, uh, you know, it, and, and, and alcohol is a legal low, you know. You do get high off it now and again, but only for about five minutes. Right. I'm no and, good with those. Uh, it causes the, the lawyers over here would be out of a job <laughs> if it weren't for alcohol. Yeah. The police would be probably nearly out of a job if it wasn't for alcohol. And uh, yes, uh, yeah, everybody thinks it's groovy and fine, you know. Yeah, I know. It's all lucky stuff, you it, know. It, it does worry me certainly that that seems to be the case. Maybe it's just been around for so long that people aren't as worried about it, and anything new. You know, legal highs and things like that, or cocaine or, or marijuana or whatever. It's like, oh, that's new. We don't like that. Good. Well, thank you for calling, Andrew. Mike called. He said the idea of including alcohol seems to be dismissed. But if you're talking about mind altering substances, then surely it's no different. Well, that's kind of my view on it, Mike. Uh, there was a story about a young person who took these legal highs and ended up drowning, but the same things have happened to people who've been drinking. We all like a pint, but it's ridiculous to have a distinction between these drugs and alcohol. You can't keep them separate. Well, that's what government's trying to do at the moment. It's to keep them separate. One side is legal, the other side isn't. Uh, Robin Peel called back and he said counterfeit goods, that I was talking about things like mobile phone chargers, children's toys, hair clippers, rollers and things like that. Um, counterfeit goods, they're dangerous for people to use. Yes, and it's down to trading standards, isn't it? Uh, to check on things like that and to an extent customs people, I suppose, to check on things like that and if any of them are dangerous, just uh, don't allow them in. Uh, Stone Age man got stoned on weed ages before he got trolled on booze. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Well, <laughs> well, would you go out and fight a dinosaur with a bit of a stick in your hand unless you were high? Uh, <laughs> well, an interesting concept. Stone Age man got stoned on weed ages before he got trolled on booze. The island should also ban alcohol in the back of the smoking bans. This would then promote the island as a holiday resort for monks, nuns and Muslims. Oh, that won't work. Monks make the drink and best Trappist beer, says Pat. I don't think you're taking this seriously enough, Pat. Uh, hey, boy, I don't get it. Why do these idiots feel the need to get high on this rubbish? And I'm using different words than the ones that G's put in. Is life that bad? Let him crack on and uh, and uh, natural selection will take over, says G. Well, A, that's a bit strong, G, even for you. Um, and B, you know, it's only the same as going out for a drink, you know, and anybody that says that they enjoy going out for a few drinks at night but they don't do it because it makes them feel happier about the world, um, they're probably kidding themselves, I would have suggested. Um, I don't have a problem with it if one, somebody wants to go out and uh, and use something recreationally to feel better about things. And, I mean, you're in a very lucky situation, G, that, um, you know, you're happy with your life. And there are lots of people who aren't in that fortunate position who do have miserable existences. And the thought of going out to the pub for a couple of beers or whatever in the evening um, is probably all that gets a lot of people through the day or smoking a spliff or something like that. Uh, and it's just uh, it just strikes me as a little bit strange uh, that one of those uh, avenues is perfectly legal, almost welcomed by government, and yet the other is, uh, is banned and could land you in jail. Um, I don't agree with drugs, but the government wouldn't admit that alcohol is a drug. Millions of people are addicted to it. If alcohol was discovered now, it would be banned along with legal highs and cocaine. It would be an interesting experiment to ask a thousand drinkers to stop for a week. Not many could. They're addicts, says John. Jan. Uh, I, I don't agree with that. I think if you've got a thousand drinkers, uh, maybe a hundred of them uh, would maybe be addicted to alcohol. Uh, if that even thinking that uh, thinking it through, uh, a lot of people just drink socially, and um, uh, so I'm sure that they could give up if they wanted to. But then why would you? Why should you? Give me a good pint of bitter any day. Been drinking plenty of it for fifty years, never had a problem. Unlike some druggies who are off their heads, says somebody else. Under the original pub laws here, a pub has to have a smoke room to get a license. Uh, under the original pub laws, yeah, but that's been superseded by law since then, I would suggest. Uh, this text in, I think uh, when it comes to drugs legislation, it's only prudent given our location to ensure that our laws are as one with the UK. This prevents the island being used as some kind of loophole or supply route. This law makes sense. Yes, 
Yes, looking at it that way, I think you're absolutely right. Thank you for that. Alcohol has a de- devastating impact on family members. We had an alcoholic father and a daughter, one of five children. Luckily, we had a wonderful mother. She sacrificed such a lot. Uh, but, uh, yeah, only celebrations now and in moderation. We've seen the effect that booze can have. New signage on the exit doors of the baby unit at Nobles. Notice to all new babies, by the time you can read this, you'll be banned from having a life. That's my worry about this. I mean, if it's on public health grounds, then fair dues. But, I mean, stuff like marijuana, is it really that dangerous that it needs to be banned and we need to be stopped from using it? I'm not convinced. Uh, For what reason was alcohol and cigarettes made an exemption to the law? Surely the research is there to show that they're just as lethal, says Rich. (laughs) Three letters, T-A-X. Talking Heads, brought to you by Magic Carpets, with the only Khan Dean design showroom on the island. You're listening to the latest Talking Heads podcast, featuring highlights from the programme over the past week. The Nation Station, Manx Radio. Should we, the public, be given the chance to put forward questions at local authority meetings? The Douglas Council leader wants to see it happen as part of proposals for the council to engage more with ratepayers in the island's capital. A committee's been set up to look into ways to get more people involved with local politics. So, should members of the community be able to submit a question to local authority meetings held in public? Or should it be left to the elected representatives themselves to ask questions? And this from David H. He says, Stu, the problem with too much public input in meetings like this is that vociferous busybodies would have too much influence well that's true you could do yeah vexatious litigant types um people who've always got an opinion about everything could uh, but i suppose that they could put in a system whereby you know it's, they're not going to be uh, uh, answering an awful lot of questions from what david christian said it was just like once per month or whatever um would somebody be allowed to put a, a question forward so maybe you could limit the number of consecutive times that the same person could get on or have some sort of a I don't know, some sort of a, a, a poll to uh, to decide, you know, <laughs> names out of a hat, perhaps, is the answer to that. But uh, I didn't realise, I must say, that you couldn't do that already. I presumed, wrongly, clearly, that anybody could go down to a council meeting and ask questions. Clearly not. Stu, I applaud David Christian looking at ways to communicate with Douglas ratepayers. He's correct. There is apathy and a degree of mistrust with our politicians. I hope he'll find ways to engage people in a constructive way rather than the constant negative attitude from many. That from a different John, thank you. With all the uncontested elections, there was room for anyone to get on the council to ask questions. Well, yeah, but would somebody want to give up that much of the time just to be able to get on the council uh, to be able to ask questions from the inside is the uh, is the thing. Um, I think on the face of it, it's a good idea. But, I mean, maybe rather than just one question a month, maybe it ought to be a case of, you know, one hour a month ought to be devoted to people's questions. It might be that there aren't that many questions. Who knows? You shouldn't describe people as vexatious litigant types, Stu. We all have rights and the right to complain. There have been enough cover-ups at the top. Uh, OK, well, that's valid enough. But, I mean, there is a type of person uh, known, I think it's a legal term of vexatious litigant, somebody who is constantly bringing cases against people in a vexatious manner. Uh, and there are people, I'm not saying for a second, not suggesting for a second, that everybody who's got a complaint is a vexatious litigant, but that is a type of person, and we all know them. No point being there is a danger of stereotyping those with little power trying to challenge wrongdoing at the top. Is that part of the first text, maybe? Yeah. Uh, the council would have to guard against a free-for-all. The chairman would have to keep things in check, otherwise sittings would go on forever. I'm all in favour of the public being able to ask questions, but it shouldn't be a free-for-all. Another problem would be if the question was asked on the day, only those who can think quickly on the feet would ever respond to it. There are some council members who wouldn't be able to do that, so it would only be a few councillors answering the questions. OK, thank you. The Nation Station, Manx Radio. Do you believe in loyalty when it comes to where you bank? A watchdog thinks the average person could save around £90 a year by switching to a bank that better suits them. The Competition and Markets Authority across the water says people who have several accounts should be able to manage them from a single app. It's so that they can compare deals and easily move money to avoid charges. Barry Weir reports. The Competition and Markets Authority thinks too few of us switch. A lot of customers could make very substantial savings. This app could control all accounts so you can compare deals and automatically transfer cash to avoid charges. Lenders will also have to set a monthly cap on unarranged overdraft charges. Jane Tully's from the charity National Deadline. Large banks already do set their own caps, but these aren't quite as low as we'd like them to be. The government will now consider the proposals. 
Do you believe in loyalty when it comes to banking? Are you more comfortable sticking with the same bank rather than shopping around for better deals? Or are you prepared to change bank every now and then? How about online banking? Is that something that you've embraced? Or do you still prefer to do your banking face-to-face in the branch? People are happy with their bank, my bottom. I can't use the word that you used. It's just been too much, it's just too much hassle to change. They all seem to treat us with disdain. Pay next to no interest on savings if you're lucky to have any and charge you for everything that they can. Charge you for personal account will be next says josh you're absolutely right yeah uh, i think uh, i can't disagree with much of that it's funny you know uh, they're pretty fickle banks i remember when i had the business uh, back in manchester so 30 years ago um and uh, when i first started the business you know times were tough and it was very hard to try and make a living and when you wanted to increase the overdraft you had to sort of crawl over hot coals to get to see the bank manager and then uh, it'd be like the spanish inquisition why do you need a bigger overdraft are you sure you can afford it was all that. Um, then when I started to become successful, I was given my own relationship manager. And uh, the bank manager became my new best friend. And uh, he came up with all sorts of things that could uh, help me keep hold of my money a bit more, including he set me up with online banking. This is going back to probably the late 80s, um, before Windows even. I seem to remember that I had a, a computer that did uh, it had a DOS program on it called Bankline, and uh, you could do online banking and you could transfer money at will with a couple of clicks uh, from a current account into a savings uh, account or a deposit account that was going to give you a bit more interest. Uh, so that was fantastic. Then when things started to go wrong in the business, <laughs> all of a sudden I couldn't get through to him anymore. And I was moved to a different person who obviously was dealing with problem accounts and not successful ones. So they're pretty uh, fickle, I think, banks, aren't they? Uh, What else have we got? One from Pam. Trouble for a lot of people is that we simply don't understand banking. I do online banking, says Pam. I check my statements each month to see that all is in order and how much interest, haha, any investment accounts have earned. As far as I'm concerned, that really is it. Being pretty uh, well enumerate, my total inability to understand what I'm told would simply make me say, leave well alone. Yeah, I think a lot of people are like that. Um, I think a lot of people uh, have a system that works for them and would be um, loath to upset it, especially if you've got all your standing orders and things like that, direct debits all set up with the bank. The thought of changing all that and and it not going wrong uh, scares people to death, I think. Stuart, I'm a bit old-fashioned too, been with the same bank for 41 years. I've had a few issues, but they're resolved. People change, then realise that they were better off before and go back to the original bank, says Irene. I've heard of that happening as well. People in a huff have gone off and uh, moved their account and <laughs> realised that they're no better off. Grass is always greener, isn't it? Um, if you've got a, a point of view about banking, would you be happy to chop and change, maybe on a, a, an annual basis, if you found out that you could... Um, Uh, keep more of your money by going somewhere else, reduce your charges maybe, would you be happy to swap banks or would you prefer to stick with somebody and uh, and build up some sort of a a record, a history with them? Hey boy, stick your money under the floorboards. (laughs) Get just as much interest as you do from any bank and at least you know it's safe. Uh, if it's with you, says uh, Graham the Gardener. Uh, well, there is that. I'd quite happily go back to a cash society, I must say. Um, it's amazing nowadays. It, it blows me away, the, the uh, tiny amounts that people will stick uh, uh, through a debit card rather than carrying cash with them. Nobody carries – everybody's gone royal. Nobody carries cash anymore, especially young people. I appreciate this is probably just a, a sign of me getting old and old-fashioned about things. But, you know, if you're going to buy a Kit Kat, you, <laughs> you hand over the money in uh, in coins. Whereas there are people, trust me on this, that will will buy something like a Kit Kat on a, a debit card or a credit card. It just seems absolutely mad to me. Um, don't carry money a, at all anymore. I'd quite happily go back to a, a cash society. Nothing better uh, than a few quid in your pocket. I'm not talking about a huge wad. But just to to make sure that you've got some walking around money in your pocket and uh, fewer and fewer people do it now, whether or not that's the right way to go or not. But uh, the the less I have to do with the bank generally, because they they do certainly with business accounts, they charge you for absolutely everything. Um, So if you can if you can buy all your stock with cash and pay your staff with cash and all that, it's uh, it's less for the bank. To, uh, to get their lick of the spoon out of. Roger sent me a text. Banks, invest in a Harley. Well, I did. <laughs> 
I've never uh, ever had much money saved in a bank. I always use it for something else. So I've got money invested in uh, another business or two, and uh, and uh, yeah, it gets invested in uh, petrol-driven things usually. Uh, but I did buy a Harley, and th- thinking about it. Um, the, because I'm old-fashioned and because I just stick with the same bank, and because I come from the generation where if you wanted a bank loan, you went in cap in hand, try not to do that anymore. I try and remind myself that they're the servant and I'm the master. Uh, I'm the customer and uh, they're the supplier. But uh, old habits die hard. So, you know, I, I did phone uh, my personal bank up when uh, this Harley that I bought came up uh, three or four years ago. And I said, uh, I've been offered this Harley and I've not got any money set aside, but can I borrow the money? Oh, yes, you can borrow the money. Yeah, yeah, pop into the branch and we'll do all the paperwork and we'll sort it out there and then. Smashing, I thought, that's a good service. Went in and a uh, very polite young lady and asked me all about the bike and was very interested in the whole thing. And she printed off the stuff and I signed it and the money was in my account the same day, which I thought was fantastic. <laughs> Until I realised that I was paying a huge amount of interest. This was like credit card interest. It was huge. Uh, but by that stage, of course, it was too late because I'm old fashioned. And I never thought to check it and see if I could do a better deal elsewhere. Once bitten twice shy, though, because I'll tell you, the next time I want to borrow any money, I will be phoning around to make sure that I get competitive prices on it rather than just going with the the default supplier. Um, Rod says, banking, the two best banks are Bank of Mum and Dad and the UTM Bank under the mattress. If my wages weren't paid into a bank, I wouldn't bother with an account at all. Yeah, back to cash. How about pay packets? Little brown pay packets. That's the way to do it. Problem with banks is the fact that they create money that simply isn't there. If everyone tried to empty their accounts, there wouldn't be enough physical cash to uh, settle everybody's uh, account. You know, that's true as well. Um, or I'm led to understand that that's true. Uh, yes, it's all a little bit worrying, really. Uh, I wonder whether or not bankers are the villains that we've all made them out to be uh, or not, whether or not it's just society in general and the fact that we all demand so much and that at the end of the day something's got to pay for it. Stu, you're definitely becoming a Manx man now. Well, I keep telling you. Uh, preferring to pay people in cash. Sounds familiar on the island with cash in brown paper envelopes. You'll fit in, boy. <laughs> it makes sense. I mean, if you've got a business, then you pay for money that you pay into the bank. You pay for money that you take out of the bank. You know, change and all that. You get charged for all that stuff. So uh, why bother if you can pay people in cash? Uh, if you're taking cash over the counter, of course. Couldn't agree more about people paying small amounts on debit or credit cards. Recently at London City Airport, it took nearly five minutes <laughs> for somebody to buy a sandwich via a card as the machine wouldn't accept it eventually the customer's partner paid counting out cash very slowly not sure which was worse says sue well that's the other thing we've all been in that queue haven't we especially at supermarkets where somebody uh, waits until they've packed all the bags then they get the purse out you know i'm not being sexist but it is always women get the purse out and then you have to go rooting through the bag to find the purse get the purse out and start rooting through the purse to find exactly the right change and everybody else you know queues getting bigger and bigger the nation station manx radio we're asking for your thoughts on what could help to bring manx students back to the island once they've qualified the government's asking the public for their views on keeping the economic impetus moving in the right direction more than 30 years of growth is very welcome but the economic development department says issues such as a lack of appropriately qualified staff could slow things down. That's led to an accusation that this is a situation that someone should have seen coming from Angela Moffat of the Prospect Union. I think that's where governments have got a responsibility to look at why we have a brain drain. You know, why are people going off the island and not coming back? What is it about the Isle of Man that's attractive for people from the UK to come and live here and work, but not for our own people to do that? It's true that 30 years ago we could not have predicted the technological boom that there's been, the kind of accelerated rate of development in e-business. However, it was absolutely the case 10, 15, 20 years ago to start making predictions about this. And I think the government has had opportunities to work with businesses locally to really kind of develop a strategy for a homegrown workforce and it and it really has failed to do that in a joined up way in government. I do know that there are companies like Manx Telecom that have really tried to lead the way in terms of e-business and developing 
um, and keeping on island skills. So there's absolutely the ability to do it. But I do think it points to another government failure. And I do know that in economic development, they have been pretty hot on this. I think it's another example of how government doesn't really work in a joined up way. Angela Moffat of Prospect the Union. What do you you think would bring Max graduates back to the island? Is it a lack of job opportunities that prevents those who gain a degree from coming back to Manx Shores? Or is it inevitable that young people from an island who experience life across the water for three years while they're at university will want to stay there at least for a few more years? This from uh, Bustry says, Stu, the kids have worked very hard to obtain whatever degree they've received. I know from our family, one came back, one was employed uh, by one of the big three accountancy firms and was located in the Bahamas. <laughs> Isle of Man, Bahamas? Yeah. Um, the one who went to the Bahamas had to manage his own budget, maintain the property, keeping it clean, etc. They both agreed that it was better for a student to work overseas first, as the student has a wider experience then when he came back, as he'd got a different understanding of life. <clears throat> Excuse me, which he says was invaluable. Yes, I think that those are all good points. Uh, let's go to the lines, and we've got our friend Neil on from Castletown. Hello, Neil. I've worked with a number of graduate students over the years through the laboratory. Um, the government set up a very good training program where, when they're where they're doing their scientific degree, they actually come and spend a little bit of time with us for a summer or two, and oh, yeah. gives them a taste of real working life. Um, I also work with a number of a large number of, of, of apprentices and, and younger people. The one common denominator which, the, which is setting them back is the, house, is the price of housing here and the price of rental. I can imagine, yeah. That is simply it. They look at the cost of being able to rent away in the Manchester area, 250 300 maybe £400 pound for a decent um, house uh, or, or flat. You, you put that to six, seven, or £800 pounds in the Isle of Man, there's a massive difference. Of course, yeah. That, that is the trouble. Somehow somebody um, has to go into Tinwald and, and break down this innocuous link between the availability of land um, developers being steered towards that availability by MHKs and then being able to profit, highly profit on on the spoils of, of what should be available for our young people. Well, again, it's one of those things that, that um, you know, it seems that the solution is really quite easy on this, but whether or not it's going to cause all sorts of problems. If you built, say, for example, I mean, just, just uh, talking out my head now, if, if we were to build a thousand cheap, affordable, first-time buyer apartments or whatever uh, that young people could move into, uh, wouldn't that devalue the rest of the housing market? market in the Isle of Man so everybody who already owns a house that you know the, their property value would go down because you've got this cheap housing so isn't that one of those knocking effects that we need to be careful of? Well I personally think that housing is way overpriced here anyway I think it's ridiculous we're, yeah. on, we're on London prices in the Isle of Man it is absolutely crazy um, one thing which government could do when land becomes available through the zoning for development it could be bought by government and then sold off to young couples or young single people to build their own house at their own expense. Yes. As long as they have a reasonable plan which had been approved by the planning department, they would save thousands. But I was skimming through the courier this morning. Um, Two-bedroom bungalows on the island, 249, 250,000 starting from... Crazy. Effectively a three, what, um, two rooms and a, and, a, and a small kitchen and, you know, a small bathroom. That's absolutely crazy. Expecting anybody who's been away got a good degree, a professional degree, to come back and to lynch themselves with that sort of commitment is just unacceptable. They simply aren't going to do it. Rental prices here, way, way, sky, sky high. It's it just bonkers. I mean, but isn't that just a reflection on property values, the fact that, you know, if you've got a quarter million pound bungalow, then you're going to want more than 300 quid a month if you rent it out to somebody? Well, I think um, I think there's been a huge cash in, in in the fact that interest rates are so low, the investment uh, potential for income everywhere at the moment, stocks, bonds, corporate bonds, equities, etc., everything is pretty flat. So the way people are making money is they're investing in, in a second, uh, second or third property and then renting it out an extortion amount of money, which is pro- probably generating them about um, 9.5% or 10% interest, which they certainly wouldn't get anywhere anywhere else. Fair dues. All right. Always good to talk to you, Neil. Thanks very much for getting in touch. Giving returning graduates guaranteed one year employment in a government department mentored by a 60 plus year old employee close to retirement. This would help their CV and encourage them to stay in the Isle of Man, says Dave. Now, 
That's a good thought. I quite like the idea of that one, Dave. Yeah, it seems like a, a perfectly good idea. Talking Heads, brought to you by Magic Carpets, with the only Candine design showroom on the island. That's it for the latest look back at Talking Heads. Our thanks to everyone who took part in the programme this week. If you'd like to get involved in the discussion yourself, you can call, text or email between midday and 2pm on weekdays, or you can share your thoughts anytime on the Facebook page. That's Talking Heads with Stu Peters. You can listen back to each day's programme in full using the on-demand section of manxradio.com and the website's also where you'll get an update of what's being discussed on the programme each day. You can also keep up to date with that information by liking the Facebook page or following Stu Manx on Twitter. And if there's anything you think we should be discussing on the programme, let us know by emailing talk at manxradio.com. But that's it for now, so until next time, goodbye. Don't sit in the slow lane. Join the fast lane right now with Shaw's all-new Superfast Plus Broadband. Enjoy more bandwidth, amazing speeds and the best value on the island from just £23.95 per month. So don't be left behind. Get a piece of the high-speed action with Superfast Plus Broadband from Shaw. For details, visit our stores in Douglas, Ramsey and Port Erin or click shaw.com. Love being Shaw. Terms and conditions apply.